Hello. Our next forum will be for Council District Number Four. Christine Liu has joined us, and Mr. Jim Gunaris. Thank you. And in a moment, um, as soon as everybody is seated, our moderator will be set to begin. Our moderator for the evening is Dorothy Schwetzka. A letters table over there just to be sure we don't have duplicate questions and that the questions are delivered in, a, delivered in a timely manner. People have been walking through, you know, members of our league to collect them in a basket, but if you have a question and you prefer to bring it up and put it in the basket, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? This is really funny. <laughs> All right. Um, the forum we're about to start is um, for the town of New North Hempstead Council District 4. Uh, just so you know who you're here to hear from. Um, thank you for attending. And good evening. Uh, for over a century, the League of Women Voters has sought to make democracy work by holding events like this so that voters can hear the views and observe the behavior of candidates on a range of issues relevant to your community. That's why we ensure that all candidates agree to the debate procedures. Further, by being here today, you're also agreeing to those procedures. The League has used procedures like this for over 60 years to ensure a fair process and encourage civil discourse. Reading the rules is going to take me about three and a half minutes, so please bear with me. I'm not such a New Yorker that I can speed talk my way through this. Um, the moderator will be a member of the League of Women Voters from outside the district. I live in Port Washington, not Great Neck. And that area. Uh, candidates' open, opening statements will be determined by drawing lots before in-person events. The same order will be used for opening and closing statements. Tonight, Mr. Gennaris will be going first. Each candidate will be allowed three minutes for an opening statement. After each candidate has spoken, I'll open the meeting for questions. Cards will be handed out, they're available uh, for written questions. In all cases, the moderator will be the final arbiter of whether questions should be answered. Questions must not be duplicative, personal, or abusive. Each candidate will be given one and a half minutes to answer each question at the moderator's discretion. A time for a response may be reduced so long as it's the same for everyone. There will be no rebuttals. Questions may be addressed to a specific candidate or to candidates in general, although all can, both candidates will be given an opportunity to answer any question that's addressed to a specific individual. The moderator will attempt to rotate the order of responses for each question, and if I miss you, Please just you. give me a sign. <laughs> Um, a league member will act as timekeeper. Tonight, this is my good friend, Marie Bellon. Uh, one half minute from the end of each given time period. The timekeeper will alert the speaker by a, a prearranged signal. Marie's showing you the, the 30 second warning and the stop sign. Uh, candidates who ignore time signals may, be, may have their speaking time reduced and or and those not violating the rules may be given extra time. Candidates will have two minutes for a closing statement. 
Since the purpose of this meeting is to determine the candidate's views, no substitute for the physical presence of the candidate will be allowed should a candidate be unable to attend. Um, no written or recorded statement may be provided in lieu of active participation by a candidate. Uh, forms require two or more candidates for each seat to be present. The use of props, charts, visuals, and the displays of campaign collateral or apparel is prohibited. In accordance with league policy, audio or video recording by authorized members of the media will be permitted only if all the candidates present agree. The league maintains the right to record the forum and publish it on league-controlled electronic pages. No other recording will be allowed. No partial transcript or recording may be published without written permission from the league. Both candidates have agreed to comply with these rules and now you and the audience are also agreeing with them by being present. Like you, we're here today because we believe that citizenship requires both knowledge and civic engagement and that the responsibility of maintaining a good government rests on the shoulders of citizens. That's everyone here. So we have expectations of you. Please be sure your cell phones or electronic devices are turned off or silenced, and please do not block the doors or the camera. Your purpose is to hear from candidates, so let's focus on their voices, not yours. Please remain seated and silent during the Q&A. As moderator, I will stop the debate if the audience interrupts. Interruptions reduce the time for candidates to speak, and we're here to listen to them. To repeat, league policy permits only authorized recordings of these forums. Taking clips or segments is not authorized. The league is recording this forum and will post it on the League of Women Voters of Port Washington, Manhasset YouTube channel before the election tonight, if, if we can. Any audience member who violates the agreed procedures for the forum or disrupts the forum by ignoring these audience expectations after being warned may be asked to leave. We thank you for being here and being here to learn more about each candidate who seeks to represent you. So with that, we are now ready for the opening statements and Mr. Gennaris, I hope I got it right, will go first. Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for putting this together, for organizing it in such a beautiful, peaceful place. I've been here before as a, as a uh, audience member, um, and it's an honor to be here as a candidate for the town of North Hempstead's new Council District 4. I'm a resident of the New Hyde Park area since 1999. I'm married, I have four children. I've put my children through the entire Herrick school system. Uh, I'm proud of the education that they've received there. When my wife and I moved in, we became very active in the PTA and continued volunteering um, in the community in a variety of different levels, including the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, um, different athletic associations, New Hyde Park Wildcats and the Little League. Um, in 2011, I decided to run for the Herrick School Board. Um, I thought uh, I could lend a hand and be a useful voice for all the residents and all the students in the community. Um, I won that election and been proud to be on the school board since that time. I'm in my 13th year. I'm also completing my fourth, I'm in my fourth year as the current president of the Herrick School Board. I'm proud of the work that we have done with regards to um, inclusion, with regards to uh, our investments in our student programs, in the type of way we deliver education to all students regardless of their ability to learn. Um, every student deserves a fair and equitable education and they should get it regardless of the challenges that they may have. I'm also proud of the fact that we realize the changing de demographics of our community 
And as we did that, we decided to show our respectfulness of the different demographics in the, in the group. And we added the Lunar New Year holiday as well as the two Eids and the Diwali holidays. We felt that if our community had changed and the demographics had changed, so should our school calendar, and we did so. Beyond this, I have served uh, the town in a variety of different ways. I've served on the Clinton G. Martin Pool Renovation Committee. I was asked to serve on the Nassau County Police Commissioner's Community Council. I was one of its founding members, and I'm honored at the fact that I helped to manage a $130 million school budget in one of the most successful school districts on all of Long Island. I welcome and thank you all for coming again. Thank you, Mr. Gennaris. And Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christine Liu, but before I begin, I just want to thank the League of Women Voters for hosting this wonderful candidate forum and for the incredible work that you do in getting everybody involved and participating in this democratic process. So thank you so much. So by way of background, I'm a former attorney for the Department of Homeland Security. I loved my job at Homeland, um, and I was there for several years, but after having my second child, work-life balance became a bit difficult, so we decided that I would stay home and raise my children full-time, and that's when we moved to New Hyde Park. So once my kids started kindergarten, I immersed myself into the PTA, which probably for many of us was like our second career, right? Um, We've met so many people there, built wonderful relationships, and headed so many committees and had a great time. And then that led to other things, like being a Girl Scout troop leader or coaching Little League for softball and for baseball. And then an opportunity arose where I co-founded the Herrick's Chinese Association, where we coordinate the Lunar New Year program for the school district, in which it's free to the community and over a 1,000 people attend every year. And through that process and community work, that's where our former um, town supervisor, Judy Bosworth, she found me and she asked if I would join her Asian American um, Advisory Council. And at the same time, Nassau County also asked me to join their Advisory Council. And I gladly accepted both because I wanted to be that bridge in the community between us in the community and also our town governments. So, in, in doing all of that, that's when your assemblywoman, Gina Salitti, also found me, and she asked that I join her staff as her community liaison, which I also gladly accepted and has been doing since she's elected. So, in me as a candidate, you'll find I have the legal experience, I have the government background, and the community service and leadership. So, with all that, I would like to tell everybody that as town council person, I will do this position full time. I've already told Assemblywoman Salitti, who is a bit sad, that I would resign from my position in her office if elected. And also, I cut back my hours already to two days a week only so that I can devote myself to the community even more so. Then, as Herrick's Chinese Association president, I did recently step down once I decided that I was running so that there would be no appearance or conflicts of interest at all, and that I can devote more time to the community. So, with me as a candidate and with me as town council, you know that I will be working for this community full time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lou. Now, we're ready for some questions and answers. Um, we're going to shake up the order. You're going to go first, OK? <laughs> and then we'll alternate after that. Um, here's the first question. What is your opinion on constructing large buildings on the waterfront? Ms. Lowe, you're up first. So with all things, I believe that we need to have a good discussion with the community. I don't believe that we should do anything in closed doors between developers or 
council members or of any nature, everything should be transparent. If there's a developer that wants to develop in on the waterfront, then we should see if the residents and the community members would like something like that. And so we should have a dialogue. That's what this is about. As town council person, we have to listen to our residents. I would invite the residents from the community. We can have a public hearing about it. We can have presentations from the developers and the architects and those of our planning engineers and traffic engineers to see if this is something that the community wants and whether it is feasible um, infrastructure, if it can handle it. There's a lot of uh, I guess, perspectives that we have to look at. So it's not that I would say no to a development or yes to a development, but we have to take everybody's voices into consideration and then we can move forward together. And that's what I would do as town council person. Thank you. Mr. Gnars. So in Long Island and especially in the town of North Hempstead, we've been struggling to try and reclaim our waterfronts through years of industrial use and, and overdevelopment, we depleted many of the resources that we've had there. And it seems to always wind up being that the people who want to develop the waterfront properties are not developing, developing them for people of modest incomes. It's for those who have the extra money to spend. Um, and it's important that we find a balance if we're going to do some sort of development, whether it's in, on the water or not, that we find a balance that becomes affordable for everybody. As we bring all the stakeholders together to have a discussion about a development or a program or a process, we need to make sure that the environmental balance is protected at the same time. Like Christine said, you know, what are the infrastructure needs, what can it handle, what can we do, and how can we make it better, and how do we maybe find a way to build it in a way that is friendlier to the environment and provide more access to those waterways as opposed to less access by blocking them off to the residents who don't live there. Thank you. Our next question is, how do you feel about book banning in public libraries and schools? pushes for parental controls to fire teachers and administrators, and restrictions on free speech. What would you do as a council member? Mr. Gnaris, you have this first. So I'm not really sure how uh, a council member would actually legislate that because that is not something that I believe the town of North Hempstead Council does. But it does stretch through the problem with hate and intolerance. Um, I believe books should be offered to students who are mature enough to handle those students, to handle those topics. I don't believe people should be forced to read anything or participate in anything that they're not comfortable doing with whatever their um, home and whatever their private and their family life dictates. Because the most important part of learning is love and tolerance and that happens at home and to just go out and try and fire a teacher or ban a book. We know what banning books did and how it started and what went on with, in World War II. We understand the ramifications of that, but I think we're in a different place now because the internet allows all those books into people's homes anyway. So the right way, I believe, to do that would be to use education to let them understand what the book is about. It's appropriate for their age. Maybe sometimes cons uh, definitely consulting with the parents to make sure that they are okay with what's going on. We do that in the Herrick School District when it comes to health education when they're ending uh, their elementary school time before they go to middle school with parental consent. So that's what I believe. Thank you. Here's Lou. Thank you. Um, actually, when I went door knocking in the Great Neck area, one of the first things I realized that you have to know whether you're for book banning or against book banning at the doors. Even though uh, Jim is right, you know, us as town council members, we don't have uh, the jurisdiction over these libraries, but people want to know. And so I am against book banning. Okay, so that's first and foremost. But I do believe parents have the right to 
um, monitor and decide what their kids uh, read and watch and what they do online. So parents have their rights, but I believe um, I am against book banning. As opposed, the other question was about firing teachers. Is that what you well, said? That was another element of it, yes. There was, there was parental control to fire teachers and administrators. Okay. Restrictions on free speech. So education is very important, and that's why we moved to um, this area. Um, well, that's why we moved to Long Island, because we want to give our kids a better education in this area. So parents do have a say in their child's education, and if there are concerns with the teacher, I believe that they can voice those opinions and bring those concerns up to administrators or even up to the Board of Ed, uh, but that is where the board or the administrators then make their decision. But of course, parents have the right to uh, bring up their concerns, and then the school will make their decision. Thank you. All right. Our next question is, as neither of, since neither of you has served in this office, both running, um, have you attended town meetings prior to deciding to run? And for how long has that been your practice? Um, Ms. Lou, you have the question first. Thank you. So I had a number of chances to attend the town hall meetings, and usually they were about things that I was more passionate about. When there was uh, the, the recreational sale of marijuana or uh, dispensaries in certain areas, and so we made sure to voice our concerns at that time. And I remember it was a very heated but very good discussion about it, and I was very happy with how the town board listened to our concerns, and um, they decided um, on their policy for the town. So I was very proud to be there and representing our community as well. Thank you. Mr. Gnorris. So I, I've, turn, I've uh, attended town board meetings on and off for 15 years. Um, I, I find that when you go to the town board meetings, you learn a lot about a lot of things that are going on in other parts of the town that you don't know about. And you get to hear the voices of a lot of the, the residents in the beginning talking about a variety of different things. Cat shelters, dog shelters, stop signs, issues at streets. Um, and it's wonderful to, to, to see that. Um, I think the advent of live streaming the town board meetings has been a help for people to see what goes on during the meetings. Um, it's not always pretty, but sometimes government isn't pretty. But at least we try and get the job done. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed many of the discussions that just took place with regards to um, a Sikh temple that was trying to be, a uh, piece of property is trying to be changed into a Sikh temple. And appreciate the fact that the community came out, the members of the temple came out, and they tried to understand each other and what each other's concerns are. And I think the community coming together that way provided that. And I think the town board meeting, there were plenty of people who were not happy with what the decision was at the end. But I think that sometimes is what government does. Sometimes the best deal is not everyone is happy, not everyone is, is uh, sad either. Um, all right. Given the worsening climate crises and the vulnerability of District 4, or vulnerabilities, plural, of District 4, how do you plan to address resiliency and sustainability? And that question goes first to you, Mr. Gennaris. So I'm, I'm not sure the, the question, what the vulnerabilities are specifically in the question. I think it's a little general. Um, so if there's something specific that they find vulnerable, I would I, I mean, like to hear that. Do you know what that would mean, vulnerabilities in general? No, I know what the word means. I mean, <laughs> is there a specific item that's vulnerable <laughs> is what I'm saying. Uh, um, so I'll just go off a couple, a couple of things. Um, I believe the town 
and we all need to figure out a way how to protect our environment. And I think we need to figure out a way how to protect our water systems, both the water coming in and the water going out, how we wind up balancing our electric use and the use of fossil, fuel, fossil fuels. I think it's important for us to all understand that the town was built hundreds of, hundreds of years ago and the capacity of the town now, the population of the town now versus what was planned for the town are two different things. So I think it's important that the town find a long range plan to address infrastructure issues and how do we make it better for the next generation who are going to live in our town. Um, I think that's the important part. I think we're vulnerable on many aspects of our, of our resources, and we need to protect them in a better way. I think now more than ever, we've had record temperatures, rising sea levels, and these severe storms that are really negatively impacting our Long Island area. I think just last week, we saw some damaging flooding um, in our community, our shorelines are eroding and our overburdened grid during these heat waves are causing us millions of dollars of hardship and a lot of mental anguish. I know for some residents, whenever they see that there's going to be heavy rain, they are anxiety filled because they are thinking about the possibility of flooding in their homes again. So I support the efforts of New York State and their goals for a cleaner future, and through my leadership as town council person, I would help our residents better understand how they can implement simple changes in their homes and in their communities, like solar panels, the benefits of that, composting, and even maybe in the town adding bike lanes to make um, our carbon footprint a little bit less here. So. We can all be part of the solution. And I think that's what we need to do as a town to see where we can, um, where we can draw together and see how we can find a solution and have a lesser imprint in our community and how we can have a greener future together. Thank you. All right, our next question goes in a different direction. Town of North Hempstead has the highest debt per capita statistic compared to four other neighboring towns. How do you plan to be fiscally prudent for the town of North Hempstead? And Ms. Liu, the question goes to you first. So to be fiscally responsible uh, means that we have to have a balanced budget. And actually the supervisor and the town board cut our budget uh, cut taxes by 5% last year, but this year she would like to cut 10% um, in our new budget. And the interesting thing is how we realize you cut taxes, where is that money coming from, right? Where are we cutting from? If your operating expenses are still the same, if not more, and you haven't decreased services anywhere, where is that money coming from? And that money is coming from our savings, which is our reserves. And although we have a windfall of reserves right now because of COVID, we had an increase in sales taxes, we had an increase in um, mortgage tax, because a lot of people bought homes here, and also the building department generated a lot of revenue because people were renovating and um, submitting building permits. So we have a $15 million windfall in the last two years. And the supervisor and my opponent would like to cut taxes further by 10%. And how we normally do that in a household, if your weekly food budget is $100 and you are now only having $90 to pay for that and you're gonna go every time into your savings account to do that, we then know you're gonna be depleting savings and those savings are for a rainy day or for if your car broke down, but not to pay for your expenses. And so we need to be fiscally responsible. I understand that there is a windfall, but we still have to be fiscally responsible because let's say two or three years down the line, do we then need to increase our taxes and have a tax hike in order to recoup those cuts that we've made now? So we have to think about that. 
Thank you. Okay. So um, year after year, the, the town kept raising our town taxes. And year after year, they kept putting more and more money into the reserves. Our reserves have a figure of about 40% of what is needed over what is needed for the, for the town to have. And we need to find a way to better, ba better tax our residents. If we're just raising taxes on the residents and we're not using that money for anything and we're just collecting more and more money and putting it aside, putting it aside, well, then why are we collecting the money if we have ample enough money in our reserves? My 13 years on the Herrick School Board, we, do, we appropriate a school tax every year. And the voters vote on that budget. The, the budget is expense-based. And we know what we have to tax. But over 13 years, with myself on the school board and my colleagues, we've decided to return $14 million back to the residents in rebates because we had excess funds at the end after we, f after we funded our reserves and we were able to tax every resident that much less the following year in a sense of a rebate. If that's the case, I believe I would like to follow that model for the town and we should make sure our expenses that we go through the town are clear and transparent as they are for the school district. And that would be my goal, to, to be able to really bring full transparency on the tax basis um, for our residents. Thank you. Our next question is, how do you stay in touch with and understand different minority groups in the community? And the question goes first to you. That's me? Yes. So I've had the honor of, of being on the school board for so many years, and I attend meetings quite frequently. Um, and I have a, a variety of different friends from ethnic, different ethnic and racial backgrounds who are in the school district. And it's interesting to know how their lives work, their families work, what their needs are, and how we always share these common goals with everybody. We're looking to find a better way to educate our children, our children to be more respectful, to find a way to have our children go to college and live a great life and move forward. And we do that by sharing our common goals and staying in touch with them, talking with them, meeting with them. Uh, the school board has provided me um, an extra avenue to be able to stay in touch and to keep in touch with different communities. Um, on the school board, we are always looking for people to come to our meetings and talk to us about different things going on. And on a personal level, through my friends network and some of these friends in my area who have now become family, we always know the pulse of the people, we always understand, and we try and do a good job to really deliver for them what the needs are for their community. Sorry, can you repeat that question? Sure. How do you stay in touch with and understand different minority groups in the community? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, that is something that I really enjoy doing in our community. We always have open discussions and dialogues of how to bring the community together. And we have a lot of diversity panels. Recently, I was asked to join the diversity panel um, in Belmore and also here in New Hyde Park. And just bringing people of different backgrounds together to share their stories. That is the culture that I would try to emulate at town council. Everybody having a seat at the table, regardless of your ideals and beliefs, but we need to educate and share each other's cultures and beliefs together. And that's how we can build up mutual respect and diversity and um, embrace it. I remember this wonderful program that I did help to coordinate with the JCC and the Assemblywoman's Office. It was to bring together Asian and Jewish students to share each other's cultures and their stories. And it was walking in someone else's shoes. And through that, you can see that the students um, understanding what the other uh, culture is going through or the other students are going through and help 
helpful that was. It just built a mutual respect between them and they wanted to have more of these workshops together. So that's what I would like to do is to consistently bring students, parents, community leaders all together so that we can learn from one another. Thank you. All right. Our next question is, in the event the position of supervisor is won by the candidate of a party opposite your own. How do you plan on working with them to accomplish needed work for the town and more importantly, more importantly, your district? And that question goes to you first, Ms. Lee. Thank you. So I think that is something that is inevitable, right? There's gonna be an outcome and it may be the supervisor that is on your ticket or not, right? And we have to learn to work together. And a lot of people have asked, how do you work together with the other party? It's very simple. I always tell everybody, listen, what we do here is not about the party. It's about the people. It's about the residents in our community. These roads that we drive on, the lights that light up our streets, the parks that we play in, the pools that we swim in are not Republican and Democrat. They're shared by everybody in the community. So that's how I feel that when we are working together, we don't vote a certain way because that street belongs to everybody. If we fix the road, it helps everybody. If we renovate the pool, it helps everybody. So let's not be so divisive. Let's just get things done in the community. What's best for the community is how I'm going to vote and how I'm going to work together. And the other part of it is it would be helpful if we didn't send all these negative mailers to each other or do all this negative advertising because that puts up a divide already. Just run on your own record. Run on your own platform. You do not have to go negative against the other person because you have to eventually, or maybe, work with them in the future. So let's build the relationship now together and just have a mutual respect for one another. Thank you. Now we said we wouldn't do that. Mr. Ganaris. I've lived my entire life, almost 60 years, working with everybody on any side of the aisle, of any race, creed, color, religion. The only way we get to really ever be successful in this world is if we work together as a community. This is not about red or blue. This is about red, white, and blue. And we need to understand that we are here in the town all working for the greater good. And if there are people who are in need of something that needs to be fixed or voted on in the town, we need to fix it. This is not about who they voted for, who, what donation they made, to and to who. This is about addressing the needs of the residents of the town of North Hempstead. No matter where they live as a council member, we vote on all, the, all these items and making sure the town is working for them. They're paying the taxes. They're paying, the, they're paying their way to have the town be responsive to them. And we should do that. And we should make sure we do that collectively, cooperatively, in a way that delivers the best government every resident should get, no matter who is in party, no matter what the, 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 the person is who's proposing the change or the resolution. Let's do the right thing for the people. There's enough squabbling going on in the rest of the world. We don't need it here in North Hempstead. We need to just work for ourselves and for each other to make sure we're all together as one. Okay. Um, our next question is, the council member job is very demanding. How will you manage to balance this job with your other commitments? And that goes to you first, Jim. So I, I, I really believe I would not have put my hat in the ring to do this if I didn't think I wasn't capable of doing this job. I am an amazing multitasker. And I have people who call me frequently for help, for advice, and different things that I can do to help them. And I always will. And I always do. So the, I believe that the, the work of the town council is, is more than just being in an office all day. It's about being out 
understanding the needs of the community, being able to have an ear for them to be heard with. Sometimes it's better not to talk, it's better to listen. And from there you can craft a way to find a resolution for them. I have a full-time job. I am also president of the Herricks Board of Education. Um, just to be clear, my job at, I have one job at Great Neck Public Schools and I manage two departments. Um, why do I manage two departments? Because I'm an excellent manager. I give people the ability to do their job. We set levels of expectations and they achieve them. I would expect the same for myself if I'm asking that for others and I have no problem doing it. Um, I'm reminded that Councilman Troiano works full time at the Board of Edu Education and he too is a uh, school board president and his community adores him and thinks he does a wonderful job and I expect to have the same reputation because I believe I can be just as intelligent, I'm just as intelligent as he is. So thank you. Thank you. So I've already told everyone my commitment is I will be 100% full time for this community. I will be resigning from my position with Assemblywoman Solidi and dedicating myself to this District 4. Thank you for explaining the roles uh, that you have in Great Neck. Uh, you have two full time positions there as head of food services and head of registrar. So it is physically not possible for you to be at all of these events or having office hours for when people want to come and speak with you, unless you want to take um, some calls between your two jobs at Great Neck to return some phone calls, it would be physically impossible for you to do what you um, need to do as town council person. So with that, but I'd also like to point out that we all knew that you were running for town council back in April and you still decided to run for school board president in May. And you decided not just to complete your term, but you decided to run for a full three-year term again. So you've got two jobs at Great Neck, running for town council and on the school board for the next three years. It is going to be pretty hard to be serving this community with 100%. And I, on the other hand, have already laid down a lot of things in order to show my commitment to this community. Thank you. Okay. Um, we need, hang on for just one moment. Thank you. We're, we're going to move on with a different question. All right. Um, this one concerns the uh, Plandome Road Business District. The Plandome Road Business District sewer project is underway. There are plans for the rest of the Bayview section of Manhasset to get sewers. Do you support this? And when do you expect to get going? Um, that question is for you first, Ms. Lou. So the sewer project is now for the downtowns and that has been approved and that is moving forward. So this is for the rest of the Manhasset area. And that is again, something that we have to speak to the civics about, to the residents about, to the community about. If they want to build sewers um, instead of having their septics, then that's something we have a community discussion about. It's not in my place to make a decision on my own or for the town board to make a decision without hearing their residents' concerns. Sometimes residents may have concerns about um, if we have sewers that we'd be building larger uh, apartment buildings and maybe that's not something that the residents in Manhasset want. Um, so I would be open to hearing the needs of the community, but Manhasset would be uh, in the district of District 5 next year and that would be Town Councilman David Adami who actually is our town council person in District 4, if you didn't already know. And he is pretty busy. So I don't know if he'd be listening to the needs of his community, but I would even if 
um, that is not my jurisdiction or not in my district. I would still value those who uh, come before us and have the needs and concerns of that community in mind. And I would reach out to also the planning developers and um, the architects to see if this infrastructure is something of a possibility for, all, for our town residents. Thank you. Mr. Gnorris. I, I think putting the sewers in is an important way of protecting Manhasset Bay. We are spending a lot of money trying to, miss, uh, Councilman Del Monte, to put in all these oysters into the oyster beds. And a lot of the sewage runoff goes right into the bay and we're kind of fighting each other. But I agree with the process of trying to bring in all the stakeholders and figure out how do we put these sewers in in a cost-effective way and how do we make sure that we do it in a way that protects our environment while still helps the, the residents and the businesses in that area from getting off these cesspools and whatever they have to do to be able to remove their waste. Um, it's important when we, when we face projects and questions like this, that the stakeholders come together, the environmentalists come together, and the planning department comes together, and we figure out what is the best plan forward for these types of projects. I almost think at some point we need to have a master plan for the town, especially for its shorelines, because it's important that we protect our shorelines and leave this for our children to be able to use and the next generation. And we haven't really done the greatest job and we're working to that. But sewer projects and everything help to do, help to protect that. And it's important that as we go to move forward, we get this type of long range planning done. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is, do you have an opinion on the use of Industrial Development Agency in building rental buildings? That's the question. So the IDA does that already um, in a variety of ways, um, and they do it pretty successfully. They take a piece of land that is not really generating much of a tax, pay, tax generation for a town or a school district, and then they offer some sort of tax break to a developer to be able to build this housing. And that tax break goes through what the property taxes would be for the owner of that property in an effort to offset the cost of construction. I'm not opposed to the, the thought process. What always seems to get me is when they do that for a school district like they could do for ours, our residents in the Herrick School District, for example, or the Great Neck School, school District, or New Hyde Park, or Manhasset, they're all shareholders in this school district's budget. And if you put the piece of property on the books and it can generate tax income, but the IDA overrides the vote of the taxpayers and says, we're gonna give you a tax break to, to build this, and we don't see the return on those tax, that IDA return on the taxes for 10 to 15 or 20 years, depending on the structure, it kind of puts the school district at a little bit of a challenge on how we would manage that. So I think the IDA and the, and the municipalities really should work a little bit more closer together on the types of development there that they, they would like to plan, and how it would affect it, and maybe they would do it in a way that it would be for senior housing or lower income housing, and that would have a less um, dramatic effect on the tax burden for the residents sending their children to those schools, you know, during, the, during that time. Ms. Um, building rental apartment units we have to be very sensitive to the community. We have to see if the infrastructure would allow it or if the community would even want it. And we have to look at the zoning laws and the guidelines to see if that is even allowed. So again, we have to take the pulse of the community and our residents. Regardless if developers wanna come in, whether there's tax incentives or not, we still have to first and foremost reach out to our community and the stakeholders there and work together. 
Sometimes it may work out and sometimes it doesn't, but most importantly, we have to look at our local government. You know, recently, for uh, it's not recently, this past year, there's a whole housing plan uh, that Governor Hochul was uh, trying to implement here in many areas and also in Long Island. And the plan there was to try to build more housing because of a housing crisis. But the problem was it was taken out of our local control. And I think that was the biggest mistake ever. We need to have control over how our community looks and how it's shaped and what is developed here. And so I do think that we have to have a master plan, a vision for the town of North Hempstead. And there are grants to do feasibility studies and um, visionary planning, and that's exciting work actually, you know, to see where we would like our town to be in the next 10 years and how to develop it. And so whether it's a developer or whether it's, um, you know, this kind of development, we need to have a master plan for our town. And if it's in the aligned with it, and if the community wants it, and the stakeholders are happy with it, then we work together. If not, then it should not. Thank you. Next question is, please outline your vision for improving services for older adults in the town. And that question goes to you first, okay. Christine. Uh, I love spending time with our seniors. That's one of the delights of my heart. I visited seniors um, at Clinton G. Martin, at Tully Park, at the Great Neck Social Center, at the synagogues, all over our town. In fact, for Mother's Day, I gave them carnations and they were so appreciative. And for Father's Day, I didn't leave out the dads. Uh, we gave out little candy treats. And listening to them and their stories, a lot of them are saying that they don't have many housing options. We need to expand our housing options for seniors, um, as well as them mentioning that their kids can't really afford to move back um, to our neighborhood here because they're getting priced out. So um, they also mention a lot of different programs that they would like to expand upon, including Fun Day Monday, maybe Terrific Tuesday, or Wacky Wednesday. Uh, they have lots of different ideas, and I loved hearing all of them. But in terms of expanding housing, for instance, I think we can look at other models because the town does have low income housing for them. Um, but it, the wait list, I was actually talking to somebody today, it's about three to five years for some and up to 10 years for others. And you have to be 62 even to get on the wait list. So by the time you know you wait 10 years, it's a long time down the road. So I think that we can look to other towns like the town of Oyster Bay that has golden house golden age housing where you can purchase um, affordable con condos or co-ops in a senior in a senior community with amenities and you don't have to sell your home you can actually have your children perhaps move into your home and help you with the um, reduced co-op fees or maintenance fees each month so there are different options that we'd be able to look into for our seniors and I'd be happy to do that as town council person thank you can you repeat the question, please? Surely. Um, please outline your vision for improving services for older adults in the town. So first, I just want to go back to what you just said. It could be Terrific Tuesday, but I still think the seniors prefer Taco Tuesday. Just, just. Um, the seniors built our, our communities, and we have to find a way to make sure that they're not thrown out of their houses and lose their houses or have to leave their community. I believe the town has a variety of different parcels of land that we could probably look at and see about how would we redevelop them. It's part of this master plan for the town that I spoke of a little earlier. Where are our large swatches of land? Can they be used? What can they be used for? Can we build more affordable housing so that they could stay close to their community, stay close to their children, find a way for them to continue to flourish in the town through our project independence and other programs that we offer for seniors. I also think maybe we have to figure out a way to 
have the stu have the seniors be able to stay in their homes. Uh, a friend of mine told thought, told me of an idea about offering some sort of program town sponsored for the seniors to be able to put the solar panels on their roofs. And that way they could generate their own electricity and save them on their LIPA bill. I met a woman as I was walking door to door who did that at her house. She pays $2 a month for electricity. I mean, if they didn't have to pay their electricity bill, maybe they would save 50, 60, $100 a month. That's a lot of money. So we need to be open-minded about plans and ideas and be more futuristic in how do we preserve those people who deserve to be preserved, who deserve to have a, a wonderful place to live and to remain in their communities. Thank you. Our next question is going to be our final question for the evening, okay? Um, and it is, what are your top three priorities if you were to get elected, and what do you see as the top concerns of your constituents? Mr. Gennaris. I believe um, my, my three priorities are to relieve the tax burden on all the taxpayers in the town of North Hempstead. I believe we should figure out a way how to make the town run more efficiently, use their money in a, in a more fiscally responsible way and figure out how we can how we can use their money to deliver services to them at class A full 100%. I'm not really sure that happens. I think in the times that we're facing right now, the current supervisor offering a 10% reduction in taxes is important. She offered 11% last year, but the town, the town board decided to only give the residents back 5% of their money, not the 11% that she offered. And I think we need to keep into perspective, my priority is the tax money is the residents' money. We should treat it like it's their money, not ours. I also think we need to worry about the crime that is really rampant all over the place, catalytic converters, um, these smash and grab things, I, the, the world is different and we need to figure out a way to support our police and support our residents to make sure they feel more secure in the house, in their homes. And I, I, I just think that cooperation is my third pillar. We need to be cooperative, we, we need to be collective, we need to work together as a community. C, it's all about C, cutting taxes, cutting crime, and working collectively as a coalition and a community. Thank you. Ms. Liu. Thank you. Um, my opponent has discussed a lot about cutting taxes, but as a school board member since 2011, not once has there been a tax cut. Not once has there been a flat tax. In fact, he's raised taxes by $16 million. And 70% of your school, of your taxes goes to the school district. So even though sometimes you may see a tax decrease um, in certain areas, but surely your tax bill is still increasing because of the taxes raised by the school district. So it's very, um, hard for me to believe that you would be cutting taxes when you had the opportunity to since 2011 uh, to do so. So, and you also mentioned that going into the reserves, I don't think as a school board member, you would ever go into those reserves because you understand the importance of why we have these reserves. So my three goals would be to increase public safety and stand up and combat racism, anti-Semitism, and um, Asian hate whenever it rears its ugly head. Uh, recently, we've seen an uptick in a lot of racial issues in our town, and our town's motto is not in our town. Hate has no place in our town, and I will stand up uh, for all those in the community who are feeling marginalized or who have been attacked in any way, shape, or form. I work very closely with the police. I was on the phone with them today talking about different crime statistics. I've done safety workshops with them where they presented um, how to 
um, protect our homes, protect our property. So it's really important that we work together collaboratively with the police, and I've been doing so for, all, uh, for a number of years. And I'd like to expand our senior housing options and programs, as well as revitalize our downtowns and businesses, because we need to bring uh, our businesses back um, to full swing since COVID. Thank you. All right. Um, I believe we're ready to move on to closing statements. And the agreed upon order is Mr. Benares goes first and then Ms. Liu. So. And how much time? You have two minutes. Two minutes? Okay. So I'm just going to quickly mention a couple of things that were said that were 100% false. The Herrick School District has had a time where we raised the, our tax increase was zero. Our average raise is 1.83 or 1.83% 1, 1 was our average over the time. And a civics lesson for my opponent here. We propose a budget for the taxpayers and the residents to vote on. We prepare a budget long term for the year based on expenses and we agree that that's the budget we're going to present to the community and the community then votes on that budget. If the community doesn't want that budget and that increase, they have the right to vote no. And I'm happy to say in 13 years, they have never voted no, because we've been good stewards of their money. And I want to remind you that when we had excess funds, we returned $14 million to the taxpayers. Go find that where the town has returned to us any money. Second thing, she, uh, personally attacked me on my abilities to work. I have not questioned her ability to be a good steward or be a good volunteer. I don't appreciate her questioning the integrity of the work that I do in my job every day. If the Great Neck School District didn't think I couldn't do the job, they wouldn't have me managing two departments. And that's what I do. I manage two departments. Lastly, I am 100% sincere in my intention to make sure that there is never hate of any kind, and it should never be tolerated, no matter what ethnic persuasion, or what race, what religion, what creed, what color. It is not acceptable. And the only way you stop hate is by starting first in your own home, by teaching love and compassion, and using the tools in the education field to be able to teach our children how hate is such a terrible thing. I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters tonight for having us here. I appreciate your time. I want to thank Christine for being here tonight. I want to thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate your time, and I'm glad I had the opportunity to address you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gennaris. Thank you. So our, our district, District 4, has been shortchanged, I believe, in the past two years from a very absent town council member. And I think my, my actions speak louder than words, where I'm telling everybody tonight and moving forward and throughout this campaign that I will be here full time for our community. I'm not slighting or saying that Mr. Ganeris cannot multitask, but it's just but it's just a fact. If you physically cannot be there to be in the office to listen to the residents, you have an open door. If you're not there, then it's hard to be present for your residents. And so that is all I'm pointing out. It is not that you um, cannot handle your jobs at the schools. It's just that we need a full-time council person for our community. So with that in mind, I also wanted to mention that um, the, the projects that we are, we're talking about, like Project Independence for our seniors, it's a wonderful 
It's a wonderful project and we just need to keep building upon it. Everything that we have in our town, this is why we moved here for the quality of life here. We just want to continue that and make it better and improve it further. And that takes a community to come together and let us know what areas that you want to expand upon. And that's what I'm all about. I'm about listening to this community, giving you my full attention and knowing that you and I can work together collaboratively in all areas of this town, whether you're Republican, whether you're Democrat, whether you're independent or unaffiliated, I will listen and respect everybody's concerns and issues. And that's what you can guarantee with me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. As it turns out, we're in the home stretch here. Um, the fourth forum this evening is not going to take place due to some scheduling difficulties on for Mazzy Philip Philip, sorry. I mispronounced your name. However, um, as a result, we are not able to offer a uh, platform for Mr. Wei Wa Yang. He is, however, in the room here. If you'd like to stand and wave. Um, so I'm putting words in your mouth, but I imagine you're available for questions privately outside, just not in the league forum here. Um, I have some other announcements, upcoming events. Uh, the League is holding a candidate forum for the Great Neck Library that will take place on Monday, October 16th at 7 p.m. at the main library that's at 159 Bayview Avenue in Great Neck. The next thing is on October 19th, the League will host two forums for the county receiver position, county receiver of taxes and county supervisor that will be on October 19th, 7th, and it will be here. At, pardon me? Town, sorry. What did I say? I don't know. <laughs> She's still in Greece. I, I am. <laughs> um, it's town supervisor, sorry. Uh, in any event, it will be here. And uh, the details are available on the uh, league's website, if, since I don't want to misinform you. <laughs> I'm scrambled as it is. <laughs> so, oh. Um, the other thing is, please remember that Election Day is November 17th, 7th. See, I did it again. November 7th. Um, early voting is available from October 28th to November 5th at 27 different locations throughout the county. Um, details can be found on the league website as well. And then, I think those were all the ad hoc announcements, yes? Okay, got it. So in closing, um, I'd like to remind everyone here that holding elected office is a public service and running for office takes some courage and uh, a willingness to put yourself forward and kind of volunteer. Um, the candidates this evening have been uh, honest and, and complete in their answers, responses to your questions and I applaud them for uh, taking the time this evening to, to join all of you and I ask you to join me in saying thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you. And the last thing is I'd like to thank you as the audience. You've been uh, respectful and attentive and engaged, and that's all we can really ask of you as citizens. So thank you, and have a good evening. This candidate, this forum is now closed.